Good morning, Dr. Paul. Good morning. Nice to be with you today. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Um, let's get into it here. I um, want to get your take on uh, going back to the primaries. And I know you got a lot of uh, grief from people for not supporting Bernie or not supporting Trump and not supporting even <laughs> Gary Johnson. And I wanted to know what your thoughts were on being true to your convictions and to liberty itself. Why is that important? Well, I've always uh, seen myself as somebody that's trying to present a program, a philosophic uh, uh, you know, issue of what libertarian is all about and defending the non-aggression principle, never really expecting to do much in politics. I didn't start off being, by wanting to be a member of Congress, and I was always surprised how well I did. And, uh, and and for that reason, I thought watering things down or just to endorse things is is contrary to uh, what I want to do, and that is present the case. So I'm not very political in that, well, if somebody says to me, well, if you help Gary, you're going to help the Libertarian Party. Well, my assessment was it wasn't a good principal program uh, that uh, that really would do those things. So I'm I'm not <clears throat> interested in that. Uh, I'm trying to deal in the area of ideas and uh, point out the shortcomings of other people. That sounds like such a negative thing. But if you're looking to promote liberty, you have to point out those things that are being done in the name of liberty. So I don't want to be tagged with uh, saying, well, yes, we you know we to promote liberty, you have to endorse this. This was always something I had to deal with with voting in Congress. If a bill was 85 or 90 percent good uh, and 10 percent bad, why would I vote against it? Well, my idea was that if you vote for 10 percent uh, something bad, eventually it adds up until, until you you know incrementally lose what you're trying to save. So uh, it's not a practical thing if you want to be the chairman of the uh, banking committee to operate that way, because that's not the way the political system works. But I wasn't in it to uh, be, you know, to try to get promoted in the political system. I was usually speaking to people outside of Washington, not to my fellow colleagues. Do you think that sticking to your principles while you were in Congress, at least to me, it set you apart? Um, Do you think that that helped? Your message eventually by always being, uh, I mean, even when um, you're on mainstream media outlets, they they always introduce you and say the guy that stuck to his principles. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it, it, I think it worked out better than I ever thought because <laughs> I, I first uh, was under the impression that uh, there's no way I could get elected to begin with. But uh, I thought, well, I got elected because they probably thought I was just average politician and they liked some of the things I was saying. But then after that, uh, my my challenge was, if I voted a certain way, would I be reelected? And to my surprise, the district uh, that I represented did uh, did reelect me, and and we did uh, decently in the presidential campaign up against a lot of uh, you know a lot of odds. So I I uh, probably am surprised that uh, that there was as many benefits uh, as there uh, as it turned out to be because. You know, many, many years ago, uh, when it was politically risky, even back in the 70s, I opposed the drug war, and we've almost essentially won that thing. We're on the verge of totally winning it yeah. if Trump doesn't undo it, you know. And then there's, uh, you know, the the, uh, the the other issues on the Fed. I mean, there was when I went to Congress, boy, that's the last thing you'd be doing is thinking that you ought to be challenging the Fed, but... Everybody challenges the Fed now, including, you know, many on Wall Street saying, you know, you guys messed up. So, you know, I feel like uh, there's been some benefit by – and the credibility builds, um, you know, by being consistent. And a lot of people in my district would tell me, well, Ron, you're doing – you know, I don't agree with all that you do, but you tell us where you stand and you stick to your principle. So that was a benefit in itself because people got in our, and remain disgusted with Washington. So if uh, if they can't identify with somebody that's willing to tell the truth and stick to principle, it turns out to be a much more positive political position than I ever dreamed because I thought you had to play the game or, or you couldn't exist. But uh, there are some people out there that will pay attention. 
Yeah, I think you proved everyone wrong there. <laughs> um, what did what did you see the difference between this election cycle and let's say in 2012 when you were running? Um, the uh, there was a lot of I mean you had a lot of support and I think that support was um, mainly for your message. Um, young kids, college kids, they were excited about this message that you were you were telling us, and even you know older folks and everything. What was the difference between that and, let's say, a Bernie Sanders or a Trump? Is there a difference between the two excitements for for what was going on then versus now, do you think? Well, I think the similarities are easy to talk about then. Uh, you know, the differences, because there, there are a lot of similarities, uh, you, you know, in that the people are upset. They don't trust government. They want this change, and they, they don't want to be lied to, and they don't trust the government. And the answers are what are different. Uh, I think we tapped into the early stages of this tremendous resentment. And there, are, there's the populist answer, but populism doesn't tell you a whole lot. It can be all over the place. And that, uh, that made, made the difference because then you have a Bernie Sanders and, uh, and you have, you have uh, Trump and then you have people looking still more so at libertarianism. And they're looking for answers. Uh, but the answers were different because when you think about it back in 07 is when the Tea Party movement actually, you know, came out of our campaign. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I was hopeful that, you know, it would be representing the philosophy that I've been talking about. And it did for a while, but then eventually that was taken over by uh, by those who uh, wanted to water it down with more Republican issues and, and not have that crystal clear uh, position so and and, uh, and so this this time there was tremendous resentment and the people uh, that tapped into that they they did quite well because I think I think Sanders was doing a lot better than he got credit for because they were rigging his election and of course Trump did uh, very well but uh, and there was there's even a lot of libertarians that uh, were and remain hopeful that he's going to have a libertarian message and and that his answers will be more in our direction. I have questions about that, but uh, it's the answers that have been so different. But um, I don't I don't worry too much about the numbers of people that turned out, which were tremendous for Bernie Sanders and for Trump. As much as I am excited about going to the campuses and where young American liberties are present, and there's fewer in numbers, but they're still alive and well, and there's 800 chapters of YAL now, and mm. and they are talking about the serious issues. Uh, I think that's important. But right now, uh, you know, the answers given in this campaign were not the libertarian answers that I was wanting to hear. No. Do you think that... Um the libertarian message maybe uh, lost an opportunity this go around, or maybe I, this is just my opinion, but maybe instead we might be, the message might even be stronger four years from now when nothing changes and folks like you at the Ron Paul Institute stayed true to your convictions. Well, that, that's hard to say because we're up against great odds. I think mm-hmm. if there's a reprieve, in the difficulties on the economy and maybe some backing off on uh, the number of people who die uh, either on our side or on the other side in these wars, you know, they might, uh, it, it might not be as uh, necessary to come up with uh, more concrete uh, libertarian answers. But I don't think that's going to be the case. I think that uh, we are seeing the end of a Keynesian economic era I think the uh, ability for us to keep financing these wars, that is coming to an end. So we're going to have to change our foreign policy, and we have to, uh, uh, you know, have a new monetary policy, and the debt is going to eat our lunch if we don't do something. But the big thing is, is uh, you sort of suggest what will, what will it be like in four years? Will they be looking more for us? 
uh, you know, you just can't tell on timing. You know, if this thing falls apart, which I think it's quite capable of doing in six months, maybe they're going to pay a lot more attention to what we've been talking about. Uh, but uh, already you see some major economic changes with interest rates starting to go up right now with this horrendous bond bubble that's been sitting out there for, and the bubble's been forming, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, 1970s. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's huge. So, uh, and that's starting to change. So I think the, the events that we can't predict will make the difference. Uh, a major event could occur next week, but it might not occur for a month, I mean, a year where it's recognized that uh, you can't patch this thing together anymore and that uh, right now we're looking at we're looking at uh, you know an administration a new administration that says well we have to monetary policy is not working on that well just hope they don't raise interest rates what we need to do is have a fiscal stimulus we need to really rebuild the military and we need to build our infrastructure and this is going to you know be good good for business and they don't uh, you pay much attention to some of the downside of what protectionism might uh, entail if uh, if some of the tariffs and things that uh, have been promised, if they're put into place, that certainly uh, will hasten the crisis that will demand that uh, we look at other options. It does sound like um, the mantra of fire up the printing presses is going to be keep going, <laughs> unfortunately. No doubt. <laughs> unfortunately, but yeah. it, you're, you're right in that um, – and it's too bad it may end up happening this way, but one way or the other, it's going to have to stop for sure. Yeah, there's no way I tell people we have the reserve currency in the world. Our dollar is strong right now. If it could last forever, uh, nobody should have to work. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you know, why don't we just keep printing money and buying more stuff from China and boost up their economy? We'll send them more money. Sure. And they can send us food and, and send us all the things that we want and cheap tennis shoes and and we don't have to employ people, you know. We'll just do it by printing more money. But uh, you know, even even the wildest of Keynesian big spenders and say death, deaths don't matter. I mean, they know they know that there's there's a limit. Yeah. But uh, they they uh, they don't want to uh, face up to it. It's going to happen. Saying, oh no, we have a long way to a long way to go. So uh, I don't think we do have a long way to go before this thing comes undone. <laughs> My son, uh, Israel, had a question he would like to ask you. Okay. Hello, Israel. Uh, hello, Dr. Paul. Um, I was wondering what uh, um, what would you tell kids my age? Uh, I'm a young man just trying to um, start to make my own way in the world. And uh, I'm wondering if you can tell me what kind of hope I can get out of uh, what we're facing here in the next four years. Well, it's it's hard to say, but I'll, I'll tell you what the only answer is is the what the young people have to uh, do is to know and understand and study and feel comfortable with the alternatives of what we have, and that is understanding what a free society is all about, what the founders tried to give us, and what we have lost. You, you got to know history, you got to know economics, you got to get comfortable for it, and then what you do with that and how you might change the world um, is. It's sort of up to uh, something you don't have control of. And Leonard Reed, who was at one time the head of the Foundation for Economic Education, no longer alive today, but uh, he said that uh, your job is to become well-informed and to be able to answer the questions. And if you make yourself available, you know, soon they will start asking you questions. And every once in a while, they'll ask, some people will ask me questions, and I think, well, you know, it's not very often – but, uh, you know, they will do that. So to me, it's education. Uh, and then you have to be comfortable with it. And then you find something to do. Everybody will. Everybody has a job to do. Some people will ask me after I speak on the campuses, okay, I agree with you, I agree with you, tell me what I have to do. And then I always say, just do whatever you want to do. or Just be well-informed, and there'll be a job. And many of them are creative. Some run for office, some become teachers, some become writers, and that sort of thing. But if you look at uh, the future, I think uh, outside of Washington, D.C., uh, the number of people now talking about uh, what we're talking about, you know, freedom for the individual and sound economic policies, uh, I think we're making great strides in spite of 
what the appearance uh, was in the, this recent campaigns where people actually says, I'm a socialist and all. But no, I think this message is, uh, is very much alive, and uh, there's reason to be very hopeful, but I still think it's going to be rough, and I think we all have a responsibility to do whatever we can to spread the message. Hmm, thank you. Uh, you basically answered my next question here, which was, uh, what advice would you give me for talking to friends of mine about liberty and informing them of that? Well, you know, that's an important uh, important question because, you know, the way you approach that uh, is makes a big difference. Um, if if uh, a person has has something they believe in and they become argumentative, it doesn't work. You turn the opposition off. So if it's somebody that you know and you're talking to, a lot of times just asking them questions, mm. you know, and having a conversation and not not pushing it, not in being in their face, that, that really doesn't work. And if you do what I suggested, if an individual is well-informed, they will ask you questions, you know, as well and seek you out to find out um, what what the answers are. So uh, I I think that's uh, very important on what the tone is. Uh, and I, for one, for, you know, when I was in Congress, I took the position that I tried very hard never to mention other people's name, especially on the House floor. I never talked about Republicans and Democrats. I tried to just be persuasive with the ideas. And uh, in time, they're more valuable. Uh, you know, ideas are the most important things, and if they're correct ideas, they can't stop them, you know, in this day and age. I, with the Internet and all, ideas can be spread. And uh, if you know and understand that, and you know, and you know the message, uh, then uh, you have to develop techniques on how you best, uh, best can do it. But um, the, the one thing for sure is uh, being confrontational uh, doesn't work as much as you'd like to say, hey, you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> because some of them don't. But, uh, they, but, but if they gain, in, in a way, it's, uh, they have to, you have to gain respect from the people you're dealing with, and then they will be more open-minded. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Well, sir, we're out of uh, time that we had for you today, and I really appreciate it again. Um, we'll uh, please invite folks to go to the ronpaulinstitute.org and go there and support the institute. We we, uh, we support you guys and, and encourage other people. You guys are doing what I think is probably the best work right now in, in the movement. Here oh, wonderful. Liberty. Thank you very much. It was nice being with you, and your son is well on his way to be a ch being a champion of liberty. Good job, Israel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. You have a uh, great day. Sure thing. Bye-bye.